This is a neck full of steatocystomas. What's up guys, I'm Dr. Jean-Pierre Galliani, a board certified dermatologist, and today we have a neck full of steatocystomas. Now, thanks to our patient for showing his video. This patient has a history of um, steatocystomas multiplex, mainly on his scalp. And, you know, you've probably seen these on uh, online. These are the true sebaceous cysts. These are cysts that originate from the sebaceous gland. And they have just sebum oils and a little bit of keratin too, um, skin cells in them. And they have these oily, like toothpaste-like um, contents. And it's just basically sebum. So cholesterol, lipids, fatty acids, and uh, esters, waxes. And this sebum is what lubricates your skin. But these patients have a, a mutation or a, a, um, a genetic defect that causes these spots. In particular, one of the genes that's been associated with this is a defect in keratin-17. So keratin-17 is found in sebaceous glands and skin cells. And um, when this, there's a defect in this keratin-17, then they can proliferate these type of cysts. And that keratin-17 is actually also seen in other conditions. You okay? No pain there? I'm doing great. Yeah, the numbing worked out super good. Mm -hmm. We already got two big ones here. You guys, holy, that's what I came for. Um, genetic conditions. So, so our patient has a history of these um, uh, Seattle systemas. And um, it, this is our second... I think this was our second um, drainage, um, and his he's, his lesions are not very big. They're actually quite small, but they were still quite bothersome. You know, he can feel them underneath his skin, and here we go. So we are um, he's already numbed up, prepped. I I put little marks with the marker in them because sometimes when you numb them, you kind of lose the the actual sight of where these are. So the marker helps me just remember where exactly where I felt that bump so I can go in there. And I use just an 11 blade just to make a nice little small hole or small um, cut into the skin and very gentle pressure and these things just pop right out. Now, an important thing that I do is I do use some pickups and scissors to remove the sac the lining of you these sacs. Gotta drain these, but then they don't take off the little sac in there. Yeah, and then they come back. Ah, oh, all right. And nucleate those sacs. Sadly, they told me I don't have enough air back there for a donor site. So I thought, <laughs> now that it's getting thin, I might as well get the cysts out of there. Yeah. Um, of these cysts, because they can reform just like epidermal inclusion cysts, and. Um, and so you don't want to go through all this and just to have to do it again. Now, one treatment that is often not talked about for these, these are, these are extremely hard to manage because the patients get a lot more of them. The, the lesions can recur. Patients can have significant scarring or discoloration after treatment, especially patients that are um, of skin of color that the skin just becomes a lot a lot more pigmented or deformed just from the from the from the cyst in there so in the past the main treatment option was to cut it out just like an epidermal inclusion cyst and put stitches and everything else but one it was so time consuming and leaving people with a lot of scars and when patients have so many of these spots, it's just really impossible to do. So really the best thing to That's do is to just sad. drain them. And then when possible, try to remove the lining without cauterization. Cautery can, it can elicit a lot of uh, hyperpigmentation in these, in these patients. These sebaceous cysts, these, these are truly the sebaceous cysts. So what people usually say sebaceous cysts are actually epidermal inclusion cysts that are filled with keratin. 
but these, because they are happening inside the oil gland, the oil gland is pretty high up on the, um, on the dermis. And when the skin is, it's, it gets thinned out pretty, uh, quite a lot. And so if you right. were to cut these out, you end up with divoting the skin and, um, and causing just more scarring, more issues. So one, one treatment option that's not talked about very much is Accutane. Accutane in low doses can help reduce the amount of sebum produced by the oil glands. And a lot of times you have to keep these patients on long-term Accutane, uh, low doses for a long time. Sometimes you can take a little bit of break, and, um, but it, it can be quite helpful. So in our patient here, we're just doing one, one lesion at a time, and I'm going, making a small cut, draining them, and then using the pickups and scissors to remove them, to try to remove that, that pocket, that lining completely. Now, one thing that happens a lot with these patients that have these steatosystomas multiplex is that they can have vellus hair cysts as well. Um, and those, that's just what it means. It's just a cyst that has a lot of these fine hairs in them. And, um, and they can also have epidermal inclusion cysts. So sometimes you'll see feeling? that. Ah, excited. And um, good. they're good. really satisfying good. to do. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's one of those things like, you know, you, you, you barely nick that, that cyst and you squeeze and it's just such, such a satisfaction to get that out and get that relief for the patient. So it's really fun to do and fun to watch, right? So a little bit about steatosystomas multiplex. The word steatosystoma actually means a bag of fat. So steato in Greek, it comes from the, from the Greek word steat. And um, it's, that means fat and systoma comes from the Greek word as well. That means a bag, purse, or bladder, right? So it's a bag of fat. And this term was first um, described by a doctor named Jameson back in 1873. And they had a case of numerous cysts that were throughout the whole body. But the word steatosystoma multiplex, that term was coined in 1899 by Dr. John James Pringle. And this was a Scottish dermatologist that lived in England. And um, he was the editor for the British Dermatological Journal, I think. And um, he's actually more well known for the eponym Pringles adenoma sebaceum. And these are angiofibromas that happen in patients with tuberous sclerosis. These little hard bumps around the nose that are a collection of scar tissue and, and, and blood vessels. And he described these, these lesions in patients that were not quite smart. I remember how, how he wrote it down, but basically, basically patients that had learning disabilities. So patients with tubular scler tuberous sclerosis have these um, adenoma sebaceum lesions. They can have epilepsy and learning disabilities. It wasn't after many years after he described that term that that triad was, was, um, was, um, correlated by other doctors and the, those three signs are known as Vox triad. So just an interesting medical fact there. So an interesting thing is that steatosystomas can happen as a single lesion. And when they happen as a single lesion, they're called steatosystoma simplex. And when there's multiple, they're known as steatosystoma multiplex. Now this one here was pretty interesting. Look how the rim of this, of this uh, um, drainage is white. So I believe that here we have a rim of keratin and then the inside pocket a was um, right. of the actual you know, the sebaceous, of the you know, the, the sebum the and the yellow, oils. Um, but that was a pretty interesting pop. Right. It was like lined with keratin almost. And, and so I called it a double cyst. But I've seen a couple of those where they're a little bit thicker, they have different consistencies. And that's because they can have, you know, all these different components of cholesterol, fatty acids, squalene, waxes, and, and um, dead skin, keratin.
Now, something that we have to talk about is we have to talk about all, all the steatosystomas on the back of my glove. I don't know why I do that, but it's disgusting. <laughs> I think that when I'm doing it, it, it's just an easy way to put all the material and not put it in a gauze that then I'm going to dab into the patient and smear all the stuff all over the patient. So, you know, you drain, you put, you put it on the back of the glove and you keep on going and you don't have to turn around and put it somewhere else. So it's a more about being efficient with the time that I have. But also, I, it's almost like, um, like an achievement, right? You have all this stuff and I can show the patients like, look, look what, look what came out of your skin. And, um, it can be gratifying, but it's totally disgusting. I understand. I, I, I think there's some strong opinions about the cyst contents on the back of the glove or blackheads and stuff like that. I see myself doing this all the time. And I really believe that when I'm doing it, it's really just about being efficient. And just it, it, if you have gauze and you put it on your gauze, I'm using that gauze to dab it on the patient. A lot of times stuff falls off the gauze, falls on the floor or gets smeared on the patient. So on the back of the glove, it almost stays stuck there and I'm not touching anything else there. That's my theory. What do you guys think? Disgusting, efficient, I don't know. You let me know. Write me a comment below and let me know what you think. But every time I see that glove, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's disgusting. How are you feeling? Great. Good. No that was a lot. I think that we did pain. like a baker's dozen no, on no, his neck well. there. Yeah, so um, really good. And they were tiny, but you can see how much content there is, right? And when they're under pressure, you, you the patients are uncomfortable. You have these little bumps on the skin, and sometimes they want to dig at them, uh, pop them, because they feel like cysts. So I'm glad that we were able to give him this relief, and he was quite happy. Now, there was a couple on the scalp here, and um, here we go. We're draining some of these on the top of the scalp. And uh, again, I think this... Now the quality, I know the quality of the video is not the greatest. This video was shot a couple of years ago. I'm going to go through all my old content as much as I can so I can get to the newer content with better video quality. Look at this. It almost looks like a horn coming out of there, you know? It's crazy. It's crazy what the body does. Um, but that, like I said, I'm going to try to go through all the old content first. Uh, I have... I think there's like three years or four years worth of videos. And um, and I, I should have done this a long time ago. I started making videos not to put them on YouTube. I started recording a lot of my surgeries to improve my surgical skills. And I would review them and see what how people heal, um, different suturing techniques that work the best. And I, as I was doing them... Um, I showed it to some, you know, to some friends and some people. And they're like, oh, you should put them on YouTube. And and so it just, it took me some time to figure all that out and, and put Rough. this content out there. And I think hopefully it can help people understand these better. And also, like I said in my previous videos, I want to be able to teach about other things about dermatology, not just these cysts. But I want to talk about skin cancers and, you know, dermatological conditions like eczema, psoriasis, and so on. So hopefully some, some good can come of all this. And the patients um, have been really helpful in allowing me to record these to share and educate the public. So I really appreciate them letting me videotape these for you guys. So that's our video. If you like, subscribe, like, and comment. Give me a thumbs up, and I'll see you on the next video.